Welcome back, Rod Turner. It's been a fantastic and turbulent first quarter. Now, Rod, firstly, would you like to give the audience a, a, a sort of helicopter view of who Rod Turner is and what they can expect in terms of your mindset for this interview today? Um, sure. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Rod. I'm based in London and my background was in developments in London up until probably 2014, at which point I started moving to more of a property investment mindset rather than trading and developing and to sell. Um, and also looked a little bit further afield as to where I felt there was gonna be some capital growth. Um, and so started doing a bit more in Manchester and Leeds. And now I've, uh, I've got an investment development company, um, various companies, um, and we invest all over the UK uh, in various different types of uh, real estate. So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's who I am and what I do. And in terms of my mindset uh, on the market, I guess um, I've, I've always got kind of one ear on the market and trying to look forward to it. Like I said, I look for capital growth because I do tend to add physical value to properties. and I seem to make lots of mistakes while I do it. So if I can have some capital growth to back me up and mitigate those, it's always helpful. That That's absolutely spot on. And I love, if you don't already follow Rod on social media, when he puts a post out, it really is worth reading. So I love following your posts because they make me think and they challenge my thought process. So keep up the good work there, Rod. And get and follow Rod on your favourite social media, because Rod's on most of them, aren't you? I am, yeah. And you, your details will be below. So, the last quarter, I mean, the, the last time we spoke, uh, I can't remember if we'd, or you, sorry, we, you had just completed on your most recent uh, commercial purchase, and, or, or whether it was just about to go over the line um yeah i think i think we probably had just completed i think everyone thought we were a bit mad because we bought a large commercial site which had a lot of leisure on it a lot of office space on it um in the middle of a pandemic where offices were well at that time were pretty much closed um and leisure certainly was closed so that was um, an interesting thing, but obviously we felt that they weren't going to be closed forever. Um, and, uh, and we're quite excited about really the price at which we bought the site and for what we felt the future value would be. So um, like any investment, you're investing for the future cash flow. Um, and, uh, and we felt that that was, that was going to be positive. And, um, and now we're getting towards kind of everything opening up. We've still got some parts of the leisure that are still closed, but opening on the 17th of May. Um, and that's exciting. So uh, we're looking forward to those opening up. And on the whole, it seems to be doing well. It seems to, um, rather than the, the industry, looking at the industry, we were really looking at the asset and what we felt, um, why it was maybe under undervalued at that time. And um, yeah, I mean, look, touch wood, things, things are going okay there and going well. So hopefully they, they continue as, as things open up and people get out and about doing the things that they like to do with other people. Well, I, I was going to say it was actually quite a smart uh, investment, shall we say, uh, that you made there, where the thing that you said at the start was about buying at the right price, being able to add value. And uh, I, I know we've had a chat with one of your business partners in this, Adam Lawrence, and he's given us some fantastic insights. I know I've been following the social media. I mean, one of your leisure rooms does look like uh, some of the places I've been in Ibiza. And, you know, <laughs> hey, look, I, I, I go out clubbing once in a while, guys. <laughs> <laughs> But it looks a fantastic uh, resource that you have created there. Now, in, in terms of that, that sort of then leads us into, we did some forecasts back then. And 
the world is a changing place. It's certainly very changing. And what I'm looking at is, okay, what we predicted back in December, looking forwards to 2021, we didn't have a Rishi budget. We didn't have um, the second lockdown that occurred in January, which wouldn't have been on your purchasing horizon, perhaps. So what do you think are the big things that have changed from your perspective? And how do you think they create opportunities for people out there? Well, I think um, on the whole, I don't think much has changed in the bigger picture um, for us. Really kind of what, what, what we felt was going to happen was that people would want to get out and about. And actually, I think the third lockdown helped us because what it did is it absolutely took away um, for a lot of people the, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, the whole kind of um, thing, yeah. working from home and being out in the middle of nowhere on your own for a while was nice and fun. And actually that third lockdown really did make people start to think, God, I miss human interaction. God, I miss... I don't know, going out and seeing friends and going out for a meal and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and same with the offices. I mean, we, we, we had a little bit of the hedge with our offices there because it is a bit of a market town and they are flexible office spaces. And so our thought process was, look, the big towns, the big city centre offices, um, which might be reducing some of their space, now we've got these people need to work from somewhere. Not everyone can work from home. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I've got my kids at home, there's there's not much productivity happening from my end. Um, and that's if you're lucky enough to have space to to work as well. So yeah. I do think there's a there's a big element of that. The other thing was the other quite benefit of it and, and hedge, I suppose, is that if people are losing jobs, being made redundant, that in history is the time where most new businesses are formed. And we know over the last quarter, we've had the most uh, new business formation that have happened, I think, in the last 50 years. So, again, that's great for our small office spaces. Um, what I think we weren't expecting as much of, um, we certainly were expecting a bit of, was the amount of... Uh, capital that was going out to these small businesses and to people I mean things like the restart grants the um, additional business well additional business rates relief to be honest we, we did think something was going to happen there especially on the leisure cent, um, sector um, but I think all in all it's really kind of much of the same it's probably pushed things back a bit but then there's been a few mitigations as well which has just meant that because it's been pushed back it means that everyone is really dying to get out and, and get out quickly so yes i do i do think um i'm certainly positive about the next sort of few months um as long as the vaccine rollout kind of continues in in the impressive kind of way it's it started um but as you said before we we started this uh this recording it's it's all well and good the uk doing well but if travel's still open and people are flying in from other places then um then who knows what will happen absolutely absolutely well i i know um you run a, a podcast called the rodcast it, it's a fantastic uh listen if you don't tune in tune into the rodcast we'll drop you a link down here on how to get hold of that and i you cover a lot of different strategies and you have some really inspiring people on. Uh, and I was inspired by one of your recent talks. Uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name and it was on homelessness. Yeah. And Connell that, Grogan. Uh, sorry? Connell Grogan. Connell Grogan, that was it. Um, and it, it's a strategy that I follow myself uh, and it was quite insightful on how uh, he's doing it at the next level on. Um, yeah, so it was, um, that was really about kind of, I suppose, more institutional and maybe more of a corporate investment approach to something that's normally, and uh, for everyday landlords, is more of a very direct, active approach. Yeah. Uh, 
And it was quite, it's always interesting to talk to people like that who are really doing what most of us are are doing but on a much larger scale like you say and what's going to be yeah. different about doing it at scale um and it's it's nice to hear that a lot of the things are the same um yeah. but also it's it's interesting to hear about the nuances and, and and what they do in essence what um connell's role is it's not just on homelessness but he runs a he's a portfolio manager for a very large company that brings institutional money into funds and they i think they have a about 11 big big funds now um, that are all about impact investment um, within real estate. So they have um, homelessness fund, they have fund for domestic violence victims, housing um, refugees, they have all sorts of different things. Um, and it's, it's just very interesting hearing about their approach and it's very sustainable investment. So um, which I think is quite difficult to do. So what they're looking at is, can we get a return on our money or on our investment, invest, institutional investors money, um, but first and foremost, making an impact to people's lives in a, in a positive way and an impact to communities, I think is probably more important. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, no, I, I found it very fascinating from a personal perspective. Um, I. Uh, let me call it I play in that marketplace the institutional um, side of the housing but not at the scale that he is and it sort of made me go hmm perhaps I could I mean the the competitors who have contracts uh, like mine are 500 million pound balance sheets Mm -hmm. Wish mine was, but <laughs> they, they tend to be the smaller players. I am the smallest player in that marketplace um, with contracts, direct contracts. Now that that sort of inspired me to actually think, eh, let's let's perhaps consider scaling. So it was a really useful interview, and you've got lots of interviews like that on your podcast. So I, I'd recommend everybody jumps on there if they haven't already. We've sidetracked from forecasting the future. That, that was me just saying a polite thank you for, for that special guest that uh, I really enjoyed. Thank you, Conal Grogan, for sharing. So in terms of looking forwards to this year, we've got three quarters left in this year. Do you think it's going to be a bit like one of them football games where it, it's a game of four quarters? Or do you think this is going to be a, a sort of, hey, look, it's going to unwind we're going to get back to normal we won't suffer with inflation or negative interest rates and things are going to be tickety boo and what where are you thinking given think, what's happened i think it's very much well interesting you say a game of four quarters because I, I do kind of resonate with that a bit um but i suppose it's about what market you're talking about are you talking about residential houses uh as opposed to flats. I know there was a report out this week by Zoopla and what they said was they talked about the supply and demand of houses on the market was down, I think, by over 30% to where it normally is, um, but the flats were up. So that was something that was pretty interesting. Or are we talking about the market? And again, within that market, you've got different locations that are obviously going to be very different as well. London's very different to um, the north, for example, at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, I also read about uh, a post which uh, a business partner of yours, Adam, put out about new key, 82% of stuff's flying off the shelf, whereas Birmingham, 82% of the stuff is stuck on the shelf. Yeah, well, uh, funnily enough, one of the other guests on the broadcast, um, uh, Fraser Slater, who talks about Prime Central London, um, when he was on there, we were discussing a lot of, he's got some fantastic metrics. And what we were discussing was the difference between houses and flats. And, and he said he was going to go away and actually do some reporting on that. And he, he did come back to me recently to show, because we sort of both said, look, it's obvious that houses are doing really well because that rush for space and things like that. Um, but flats are, are really struggling. And interestingly enough, you look at the new stock to market is also, there's a lot more flats being built than there are houses around the area. And, and, and that sort of contributes to the whole supply and demand issue as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, look, there's so many 
nuances to various different markets and then you've got the commercial and people talk about commercial as if it's one market and we know that look, industrial big sheds behave very differently or well, yeah. certainly last year to leisure or office blocks and things like that and, and then even with offices you look at prime central london yields have never been squeezed this hard before ever so prime central london offices are currently trading at higher prices than they ever have done before which seems mad when you yeah. read all the reports about hsbc and all these different large sort of corporations reducing the amount of um space they want or reducing the amount of people in the office and then you start to think well is that because desk space is actually increasing and how is this going to go forward so uh, and then you kind of think well is this actually to do with returns these institutions and and bigger players are willing to take on their money because they're looking at well if the office is typically more of a a bond type uh, asset in their uh, real estate portfolio then what's their risk-free rate against actual kind of government bonds and it's looking at how those yields are being squeezed against other investment opportunities at the time and actually just because you used to get five percent on something now you get three percent is yeah. that bad well it, it's only bad if those other opportunities are still out there at five percent um absolutely it, it, it's the opportunity it. cost of isn't it yeah yeah so i mean there's there's so many different things to kind of think about so yes i would say that different markets i do think will will act in different ways for example i think any sort of outdoor leisure spaces uh if you've got a nice nice summer um will be absolutely heaving uh for the next three four months um and most leisure spaces will do pretty well um, I would have thought uh, for the next for the next few months, but what will be interesting is what happens with business rates when they start to come back in and bite. Um, how will those businesses be affected? I know business rates is always a big issue for us. Um, then there's uh, other things about this whole thing about where are people going to be working from? Is everyone actually going to do two days at home, three days in the office? And especially when you're in cities, one of the big barriers to people going into the office is not wanting to be in the office it's it's not wanting to get on public transport at rush hour and things like that and in the summer you might find actually that's that's not too bad because you get a lot more people cycling in and, and mm. things like that but what happens in the winter and so yeah there's there's an awful lot to think about there i think um but i think you have given us a lot to think about i mean observationally uh, we're talking about the amount of office space and I, I was reading some statistics earlier this week and it was basically saying that the figures of office space uh, committed to last month were only something like 600,000 square feet less than they were two years ago, yeah. taking out the uh, COVID blip, mm -hmm. shall we say. So. We're not back to pre-pandemic levels, but it's grown quite significantly. But my observation would be the people who are taking the space and not people who are running call centers or um, office boxes, they tend to be people or, or companies that are using intellectual capital where you need people to be working together spurring off ideas yeah and google's one of those companies that has taken a huge amount of space in central london mm -hmm. on the basis that they want their people brainstorming absolutely and that's i think you've hit on a really good point where this is very specific to industries and locations because certain industries thrive in certain locations so london has always been a financial services sort of area there's a huge kind of increase in, in fintech and, and just tech in general there as well. Like you say, Google taking up spaces yeah. where people do need to be a little bit more creative. And it's there's only so much you can get out of maybe um, shadowing your boss on Zoom and, uh, and over the phone. It's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. And I don't think those whiteboard in sessions, you can't really do that on Zoom as effectively as in a room. Absolutely. And it's looking at kind of different locations and understanding what are the industries in those areas that where which take up people's workspace. So I don't know you, you might have 
Amazon in uh, Doncaster, for example, yeah. is, a huge, is a huge employer. What, what else is there? So are people going to be working from home or are they still going to be going into the Amazon offices and things like that or warehouses? So it's always interesting to kind of look at those things. And then if people are traveling into the Amazon warehouse, then is, is the, I don't know, the, the local Cafe Nero by the Amazon warehouse going to survive? Yeah, they probably yeah. will. Whereas if actually it's, um, I don't know, a, a call center where people are now calling in from home or even abroad, then are those kind of secondary services and, and real estate, are they going to do well? So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It is. It, it, it's, it, it's a market of many different places. Um, and each sector has got its own different pace. I mean, if I was to put you on the spot and sort of say, Rod, you know, where are you putting the smart money this year? Is it in crypto? Is it in property? Is it in currency? Is it in coffee futures? Is it in gold? What would you sort of go, well, the smart money is in residential property, commercial or, or something else? No, it, it depends on, like, like everything, I'm going to give you a really wishy-washy answer. And say, <laughs> it, 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 it depends on people's risk profiles, how long they want to be in that investment and all these kind of things. Because what someone's worth 10 million quid is going to invest 100 grand with is going to be very different to someone who's, I don't know, 21 has got 100 grand, but also got the ability to go out and earn as well. So yeah. in terms of what I'm doing, I'm, I mean... I'm quite bullish on London at the moment. I, I think it's it, there's a lot of it is quite undervalued, um, which I, I, I've, I have put my money where my mouth is on that one. And we've, we've bought a couple of, uh, of sites there. Um, I also think that um, residential stuff is, does look quite safe um, yeah. for the going forward. Um, we know that on the whole, residential is really about affordability and while we've got very low interest rates and the outlook of low low interest rates kind of still to come and we've still got a lot of money that's been pushed out into the the kind of the market really um in terms of what people are doing what people's earnings are um i think i think i can be fairly kind of positive on that um in terms of commercial Again, it's it's about what are what are the new things in the '90s? We had loads of pubs that people yeah. wanted to go to. In the noughties, it was coffee shops. Then it sort of turned into fitness stuff. Now there's always that thing about kind of um, uh, competitive social things to do. So yeah. that's always a big thing. It's it's I'm always thinking, well, wh where are people going to go and spend a rainy Saturday afternoon? Are they going to mm -hmm. be at home? Or are they going to be going out and doing something? And sorry, I'm going to I'm going to give Rodcast another plug. One an, an interesting one was um, we had the head of um, ga uh, gaming for PwC on there, and he I talked remember. about real estate and how gaming and esports was one of the fastest growing um, industries in the on, on the planet, and. Um, something I know absolutely nothing about. And it was just really interesting to see what sort of a different generation to me is doing with all their free time and where they're spending their time and where it looks like they want to spend their time. So I just found things like that I find uh, really, really interesting. Um, in terms of kind of other assets, cryptocurrencies, I had a bit of cryptocurrencies. I sold them all in... I don't know, earlier this year, probably around January, I think. Um, I'm just not really comfortable with it, to be honest. Um, I don't, I, th I think, I think there's things pushing up the prices that are not relevant to their value um, in, in the same way as kind of my, my feelings on Tesla are. I think that some things they do are fantastic. I just don't think they're worth the money that people are paying for. Yeah. It's what you call a dot-com boom and bust scenario. Yeah. You can see it's in the boom phase. Yeah. And I wouldn't wish to pop anybody's bubble, but being controversial, and if you agree with me, drop a comment. If you don't, obviously, uh, drop me another comment. Tell me why you don't agree. But I think it, it, it's a bust that's 
waiting to happen. Uh, everybody's living on the dream that it only goes one way. And that, and that's, I, I suppose, is the good thing about real estate and hard assets is when you are investing in them, is there a utility? And I think that's the great thing about kind of residential property, especially where it, it, it kind of behaves a lot like a, a commodity because it has that utility, it has that use, but also you can, uh, you can structure it as a leveraged equity. Um, yeah. And so you can, you, can, you can manipulate it, I suppose, is probably the word I'm trying to, trying to use to your advantage. No, absolutely, absolutely. And that goes for all, all, all property, I suppose. But, and then it's looking at where there's property out of favour and if you can get your hands on it. And then the other problem comes with, well, can you finance it? It might be out of favour and it might be low, but if you can't finance it, where do you go then? So yeah. well, I think it's a case of, as you say, being able to repurpose it to a different customer base. Now, all of the permitted development rights for um, the new use classes that were announced last year were confirmed uh, at the end of March. And that has enabled people to start repurposing. I mean, shops may seem like they're out of favor, but the new trend is actually dark shops. Mm -hmm. If you know what dark shops are, if you don't, drop me a message and I might do you a video on it. <laughs> but we've all seen and heard of dark kitchens, which is a trend as well. So it's about, like you say, the, the PwC report on the gaming, understanding where the market is, understanding consumers, understanding demographics. I'm of an age group, you know, a lot older than you, Rod. So I, I'm sort of um, looking at things in a different lens again, but Gen Z, Gen X, Gen yeah. Y, they're all looking at things in very different ways to what we are. They grew up with a device stuck to their hand from the moment they could hold it. Yeah. Yeah. And as a result, they're working very, very differently. They also have very different values. So I say very different values. A, a mindset. They've got very different priorities. Yes, and that's it. That's, that's an interesting kind of point when you talk about inflation and where people say, and, and also affordability, where actually you look at, I don't know, um, servicing a mortgage at the moment is far cheaper than it's been um, even though even though you're taking bigger amounts it's far cheaper than it's been in proportion yeah. to the average salary um, yet a lot of younger people don't feel that way but it's looking at well, what are they prioritizing their money going on over that and I, I was speaking to someone the other day and we we're talking about kind of when I was a kid and you'd go out for a, I don't know a family kind of day at a theme park or something like that You'd never dream, of, I would never be able to go into the McDonald's and get something. It was always now you take a packed lunch, sandwiches and things like that. And that's just me and my kids, like we don't do that because we prioritize the fact that we can go and buy it and it's convenience. And there's so much more emphasis on convenience than, than maybe yeah. other things. And I think that's, that's interesting. Um, having said that, to counteract that, I, I kind of think of the British as not good savers, but then we heard in the uh, last quarter quarter before that it yeah. was the most amount of saving happened in, in credit card debt repayments, but maybe that's just yeah. because they've got 150 money. 150 billion, 150 billion, that's, that's a small amount of money. Now, is that because they physically couldn't spend it because the things they wanted to do and the things they normally prioritize weren't available at that time, or is it because they felt actually, let's, uh, let's pay off some debt while we're here. So who knows? Yeah, it, that, that's an interesting debate. I mean, I know a lot of people who've invested money in their houses because they couldn't go out. So they want to make them better places to live and spend a lot more time. But are we saying we spend 150 billion on Costa Coffee or Cafe Nero, you know, where the brands exist, holidays, and trinkets and junkets just walking down the high street or social experiences such as your uh, leisure facility. I mean, I would have and thought, people just couldn't. I would have thought the answer is we spend more than 150 billion on all those things if you look yeah. at the industries. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it, it's interesting. I, I know some people who've gone overboard on 
buying from Amazon. So <laughs> it's it's a case of trying to sort of rationalize it and say, yeah. what is the masses doing and providing for that need? If you're there providing for that need, you're always going to be in business. Well, it's like looking at a basket of goods, isn't it, on the on the CPI factors? And what is that? And what is do people still go out and spend sort of is it butter and milk and baked beans or is it now netflix subscription gym subscriptions and um it's, it's always interesting. yeah <laughs> you have like the, the the credit card companies that release their reports don't they that's um, right and that and they're, they're always quite interesting but then they don't include the di- a lot of direct debits that come out so it's always it's always difficult i think to to come up with what that number is and what people are spending their money on. But I quite like to look at the, the proportion of someone's salary and what that's being spent on rather than the nominal amount. And um, it's always interesting to see kind of food spends and groceries are very cheap now, but a lot more people go and spend a lot more money eating out than they did yeah. before. And yeah, so it's, yeah, people like to socialize. I think that's, uh, yeah. We've missed it. We've missed all of that networking and I can't wait to uh, get back out there and network with uh, everybody on this channel and my peers uh, and come and enjoy seeing your leisure complex up in Alfreton as well. So, a, a, a point, because you, you co-founded the Boardroom Club with Adam Lawrence, is there a... What, a pearl of wisdom that you can share for the audience today that you would sort of uh, make people go, wow, oh, Rod, somebody I've really got to follow it and I've got to get into that boardroom club. What, what would you say? <laughs> well, I think it, I've, I've kind of already mentioned it, but one of the things, uh, I, w- I wouldn't class it as a pearl of wisdom, it's just more of an observation really that I see people doing and a lot of people compare investments to either what they've done in the past in a different market, different economic environment, or what other people have done. And I just think that's such a, uh, a mistake. I think if you, the only thing you should be comparing any investment opportunity to is another investment opportunity available to you at that time. So do you have the funding available for this other one? If not, then it's not something that can be compared to. And I think that makes people often stay away from deals that looking five years down the line can be uh, decent deals. And um, and then I, I guess the other one is understand your metrics and what, how you're measuring the performance of an investment. I see far too many people using metrics like return on capital employed for a long-term investment and it just doesn't tell you anything meaningful about that investment um it's good for trades and short-term trades absolutely but it's it's not useful for uh, for holding an asset and i'd say something like uh, net return on releasable equity would be far more yeah. of a valuable metric um on something cash like- on cash return and yeah. stuff like that returns over time all that yeah. sort of stuff are far better yeah, so, yeah. Really great advice there, Rod. Um, We're going to drop your contact details below of how to get in touch with you. But thank you once again for joining us, sharing some real insights into where the market has changed following our last review, where you think it's going. We'll have to do a catch up in another couple of months and see if we're on track or gone off track and what Rishi's done to change that. But Next week, we've got some more great interviews coming. So if you stay tuned, smash that like button, hit the share button and uh, drop Rod a comment. I know Rod jumps on and responds to your comments. So drop him a comment and tell him if you agree or don't agree with his analysis of the market. Thank you very much, Rod Turner, for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. It's been great fun. Thank you.